We need you to sing this song with us. Listen up, listen up. God of creation, there at the start before the beginning of time. With no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life. And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born.
Trust God for uh, a good um, a good teaching of the Word of God from the New Testament as usual today. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we appreciate you and thank you and we honor you and we adore you and we lift you up and we proclaim you, Jesus, Son of the living God, as King over everything. And we declare your majesty and we declare your glory and we declare your power. And we say your kingdom is here, it has come. And by the Holy Ghost, we manifest that kingdom. Amen. And thank you for teaching us the word of life and showing us the path of living. Amen. And thank you, Lord Almighty, for not only sowing the seed of the word in our heart, but helping us that it may germinate and bring forth food in manifest in manifold. Amen. We receive unction for teaching and we receive grace for understanding the devil for the teacher and for the errors. In the name of Jesus, and thank you, and thank you, Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. In Jesus' marvelous name we pray. Amen. 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 Wherever you are, let's go ahead and just worship God a bit. 
I want you to thank him and exalt him. While you're doing that, I want you to share your links. I've shared mine on quite a number of platforms. So I'm going to quite a number of platforms. I'm going to share it now on um, I think just one or two remaining. So go ahead and just and share it and, and just share it here and there. Life applicable teaching of the New Testament. So go ahead, while you're doing that, go ahead and just worship God, exalt Him, exalt Him, exalt Him, and lift Him up. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We worship you. Oh, yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, we praise you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Blessed be your name. Yes, Lord, with all my heart, with all my heart, I worship you, I, I worship you, with all my heart, with all my heart, with all my heart, with all my heart, everyone say, I worship you. We know my heart. We know my heart. We know my heart. We know my heart. I worship you. I worship you. We know my heart. We know my heart. Jesus, I worship you. We know my heart. We know my heart. Jesus, I worship you. We know my heart. We know my heart. I worship you. I worship you. We know my heart. We know my heart. Everyone say, We know my heart. All of my heart. I honor you. I Name with all my heart, all of my heart, I honor you. I honor you. Tell him, I know you, Lord, with all my heart, with everything in me, with all my heart, all of my heart, I honor you. I worship you. I praise the Lord with all my heart. Hallelujah. Blessed be your name. With all my heart. I love my heart. I love you, Lord. Come on, say with all my heart. With all of my heart. With everything in me. With all my heart. I love you, Lord. I We know my heart. We know my heart. We know my heart. Wherever you are worshiping tonight, you worship you, Lord. I worship you, Lord. Lady Rushataya, Nero Pricket is going to be a little more. Nene Mosha, Liko Prondi, Nene Mosha, Nene Libro si è nama kondrea, ma babro di kenabaz vilienis. Shalamandras, thank you Jesus. Bless every God. Bless every God. Amen. Wherever you are, just joining us, it's um, the midweek service, and literally it's life applicable teachings of the New Testament. Um, why life applicable teaching of the New Testament? 
um, we could do exegesis of the scripture just for um, theological sake, for our apologetic purpose, uh, or for homiletic purpose, just mere ceremony. But I, I believe that the word of God is both for time and for eternity, which means it's for the time it was written, when it was inspired, or when it happened, when whatsoever event recorded happened. But it's also for eternity, which means from that moment till Jesus is will come, the Bible said, "Your forever, Lord, your word is said." That word is applicable, so that if somebody is going through Sarah kind of experience, he can experience Sarah kind of miracles. And if somebody is going through poor kind of challenge, he can receive poor kind of resilience and patience and grace and victory. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, you know, if somebody is, is going to be an inheritor like Abraham, he can apply Abraham kind of faith. And, and if that is the case, then the teaching of the scripture, in particular, the, the Bible naturally should be taught in the light of the New Testament because what brings the Bible alive is the New Testament. Mm. If the New Testament didn't happen, the Bible would have still remained just a mere letter. But because and the Bible said the letter kills, the Spirit gives life. So, but the, the death and the resurrection of Christ, his ascension and his enthronement on the throne of life and the throne of grace makes the word of God come alive. It makes it come alive. So when we look at the scripture, there are so we need to see it in the light of the New Testament. Having said that, we literally are led to do the teachings of the New Testament in particular in a life applicable form because that is where Christian character are formed. He said, lay aside every malice and every superfluity of naughtiness, 14, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1, receive with meekness the engrafted word of God that whereby you may grow, you know, you receive it into your soul. So we've been doing that since um, for a while now, and we are on the eleventh chapter. We started from the first chapter of um, the First Corinthians, so we are today on the eleventh chapter. So we're going to do verses one and fifteen, and um, the the eleventh chapter of the book of Genesis, the first part, talks about something that is a bit controversial. So let me start by the way of explaining. In the body of Christ, if you go born again in the in the pre millennia pre the new millennia, or especially in the in, in some times back now, one of the major con bone of contention <laughs> in the church was: should women cover their head when they come to church with something, or should they not cover? In fact, it got it became a major doctrinal issue. Some people were able to strike balance, some were not able to strike balance. So let me first of all say it up in it all that um, if you want to cover your head going to church, that's fine. If you don't want to cover your head going to church, that's also fine. And uh, we're going to look at um, this scripture today, and um, but we're, going to, uh, we're not going to so much focus on covering of head, really. And the reason is because the covering of head or not covering of it, we will see how it's 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 come about. All right. So let's look at First Corinthians chapter eleven from verses one to fifteen, and we're going to look at it in the context of navigating cultures and traditions. How can I, as a Christian, navigate cultures and traditions? Um, every society has its culture, has its tradition. Cultures are set of non-written, non-constitutional belief set that that eventually influences the way of life in a society is necessarily not by law or by constitution it evolves through times through history through events in their past and all of that and when it becomes 
uh, repeated practice, it becomes a tradition that is being observed. Now, everywhere church goes, the gospel, I want us to get this thing in a very clear term, and you probably need to listen to this teaching again and again. The church started in Jerusalem, physically. The church started when the Holy Ghost came down on the day of Pentecost in the upper room. So the church started in the city of Jerusalem. They, just like Jesus said, Acts chapter 1 verse 8, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you, you will be witness to me in Jerusalem first, then Samaria and Judea, then the utmost part of the earth. So the church literally started from Jerusalem, which was the capital city of the Jewry then. And from there spread first of all a bit within Jewish community and then moved out of Jewish community, spread to Gentile community and uh, in particular the Asia Minor and all of that and then Europe and all over the world. Um, every time the church gets somewhere, it, the, it picks on the color of the tradition and culture there which is natural. So for example, um, you, it's easier to find most Pentecostal churches, pastors wear suits today because um, the spread of the gospel in the 19th, the, 20th, the 18th, the 19th and the 20th century was from the um, European and the American community mm -hmm. and so it influences. So for example, when you hear the word, they've always sang in. They've always sang him in the Bible. The Bible talks about, I wish you, Ephesians chapter 5 talks about um, making melody in our heart, singing hymns and spiritual song. But the hymns as we know it today is a reflection of a culture of music from where the church actually spread in the last 300 years thereabout. So, um, the same thing with many other things we do, the way we do our weddings today, the, 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 the gown, the white gown, the suit, the ring and all of that, they are necessarily not spiritual, they are necessarily not, they, many of them are symbolic, but they are necessarily not spiritual, and they reflect culture and tradition. So for example, if you have, um, let's say, African origin, um, if you go to church and there's, there's no danceable music, very not likely you will find it interesting because I mean it's part of the culture there to dance. So dancing music. So it's easier to go to a church of European cultural affinity and just be stoic and praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of the You know, but when you go to a church that whose culture is from um, uh, a place like Africa, there's so much of dancing. The America, there's so much of um, noise and energy and charisma. It's, it's culture. Now, so what do we do? But beyond those are, but beyond that, as a Christian, you're going to find yourself in a, in a working environment that has its own culture and tradition. You're going to find yourself in marriages in a society that has its own culture and tradition. And when that happens, how do I navigate it? So, and that was what actually gave back to the controversy of covering head. Now, so, and so we're going to look at it in, the, in, the, in that context today. So let's start from the first verse. So let's look at navigating cultures and traditions. So, um, verse 1 and 2 first. Let's read that. He said, imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 and 2 now. He said, be thou imitator of me. Let's look at the original kingdom. He said, be ye follower of me, even as I am of Christ. Now, so the new KJV says, imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things, and keeping the traditions, you see that, the traditions, just as I deliver them, to you. So there were certain practices they were doing that became norm. So let's look at those two verses first under the caption of the church has its own tradition. I want us to look at from those two verses that the church as a body 
has its own tradition. And it says, we do well when we keep and practice it. The church has its own tradition. We have our practices. You know, so we, we can't navigate the secular culture. The secular means the not the world culture, the environment, the way, wherever we find yourself, and, where, and, and, and every society, like we said, culture doesn't mean fetish thing. No, necessarily, no. Fetishism is a culture in a certain part. No, but culture is beyond the culture, is everything. There's, there's the clothing people wear, it's a, it's, 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 it's a culture. The, the, the food, the music, how they, they, they celebrate, and all of that, they are all cultural. Everything. Everything. If you get, for example, if you live in Europe here, yeah, it's easier for you to hear of St. Patrick Day, St. So 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 Day. It's a culture. You know? So, uh, so he said, so how do we navigate? So he said, we cannot navigate secular culture and tradition successfully as, as believers if we don't get our focus right. So my first assignment as a child of God is to not focus on traditions and culture first. To not focus on how I want to change tradition or culture first. To not focus on the argument about it first. But to first of all get my own focus right as a Christian. So, it's, so when he wanted to discuss the culture of covering air or not covering air, he said, listen, be imitator of me or be follower of me as I'm following Christ. Which means my way out of every trap in every, every there's no perfect culture. There's no, there's no, there, every culture has its own pros and cons. And he said the only way out is to first of all be an imitator or a follower of one who is following God. Or be a follower of God. In fact, remove the middleman first. Say, I, my focus is God. Truly, if your focus is God, you will see and know those who are true leaders and who are true people who show people way of God, you will follow them. So, we, the first thing is to first of all get my focus right. The first thing is to um, be determined to imitate what will help you to know Christ more. Be ye imitator or follower of me as I'm a follower of Christ. So which means my first focus is not, is not whether um, the culture appeal to my taste or not or tradition. Is the first my first question is will this thing help me to follow Christ? Christ more? Will he help me to follow Christ better? Will he help me to be a better witness of Christ? Like we saw in the previous chapter last week, he said, for example, um, my freedom and my liberty is unlimited in God, but it's limited to expediency, what is profitable, both in following God and being a good witness of Christ. So as a Christian, your focus is on will this help me know God more, serve God more, and be a better witness of Christ. And to also remember what do we practice in church as our tradition that we enhance this, that we enhance you following God, following Christ. For example, we have a culture of prayer, a tradition of, of love, of forgiveness. We call ourselves brothers, brethren. You can't come and breach that. No. You can't say no. We have a tradition of attending church. They go from strength to strength. Everyone in Zion appear before the Lord. So we have a tradition of coming to the house of God. And it enhances our spirituality, our spiritual life. We have a tradition of giving to the church, the house of God. 
You can't form a group on WhatsApp or Facebook and say, no, don't give money to church again. Pastors are... No, you can't. It's a tradition that enhances spirituality because it enhances us being able to do the work of God. We have a tradition of um, one man, one wife. We have a culture of bringing up children in the admonition of the Lord. We have a culture of um, um, uh, not, not consulting spirits of the dead and, and, and all of those. And they are to enhance spirituality. Like I, 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 I taught talk some people the other time. I said, you know, when we got born again, early in those days, 30, 25, 20, even 20, 30 years ago, Christians were taught what is called money quiet time which means quiet time you find a time mostly in the morning before you get into the rush of the day and you take your time in meditation and reading some portion of scripture and praying you is you and you keep it as a, a a tradition every day all your life because it enhances your spirit man just the same way we have hygiene culture in the natural realm, when you wake, when every day you brush your mouth, and at the end of the day, it constitutes part of your healthy living. So, so we have this culture. We have a culture of fasting in the church, which helps us to um, do away with um, fleshly aggrandizement and pleasure for a purple, for a moment to seek spiritual nourishment. It's not. It's even beyond that. It also shows determination. It shows remorseness. It's also a way of subduing the flesh. It's also a way of telling God, "I'm really interested." Because Jesus said, "Ask, it shall be given." That's mine. He says, "If you can't find by asking, find. Seek, you will find." He said, "If that is not working, then apply some element of force. Knock." Mm -hmm. So, so we fast to knock. So I'm God, I'm not taking any other thing but you doing this thing for me. And all of that. So the traditions and culture of the church. But when you look at what the church holds as tradition, they are things that help us to be imitator of Christ. Or follower of Christ. So before church hold on to something, before believers hold on to something and say, oh, that's our culture and tradition as believers, the question is, does he on our spirituality? Does he help us to know God more? Does he help us to get to know Jesus more? And does he enhance evangelism, our witnessing? Praise God. Amen. So that is the first way out. So before somebody starts arguing about, should we cover here or should we not cover here? So the question will be, does he help you to follow God? Does it help you? To, so, for example, if you get to a place, for example, you are on mission and there uh, is an offense for them not to cover here, there, I mean, cover your hair there. That's it. And if, for example, you are where they don't cover hair, you want to cover your own hair, cover your own hair. Without offense, without um, judging those who don't cover or, or being judged by those who cover. You know what I mean? Who don't cover. You know, that is it. So, the, so that the first question is, church has its tradition, and every tradition of the church is to help us to be imitator of Christ, to focus on Christ, praise God, Hallelujah. to follow after Christ, Hallelujah. praise God. All right, so that brings us to the third verse, which says, amen, I think I've spent a lot of time there, but it, it, it will get faster now. So verse 3 says, but I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and it's talking about male heir. And the head of woman is the, is man, and the head of Christ is God. So I want us to look at the concept of headship on this verse. The concept of what? Of headship. Now, not there that it never say, I want you to know that the head of every, every man is Christ, and the head of every um, male is, uh, every female is male. So which means... In the context of this scripture, it's talking about a man and a woman in marriage. And it's one of the traditions of the church. Feminism cannot change it. Modernization cannot change it. 
in the context of marriage, the man is the head of the woman. But the question is, does the headship of man to woman depict superiority of being? Not at all. I've never seen any time you go around the city of London or wherever city you find yourself and you see Mia Ed walking on the street. And you say, oh, that's the head of uh, Dr. Uh, so so so, Mr. So so so, working here. The body is at home today. No. When you say I saw so 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 in the mall, is that includes both the head and the body? Where the head is, that's where the body is. If you separate both, it's called death. So which means when it comes to um, this concept of headship, headship and the hierarchy of authority is of God. Let's first of all get that it's of God. Is God rebelling against headship and authority, whether in marriage, in society, in particular in you know in marriage and church, rebelling against it is rebelling against God. Mm. Authority, headship, is God way of of doing His things. Maybe if you become God and you create your own world and your own universe. You can say, oh, well, there's no need for headship. No, which headship? So, when you see rebellion, rebellion in any form, parents, uh, children rebelling against parents, rebellion within marriage, rebellion within church, is satanic. Satan is the original rebel. He's the one who rebelled in heaven. So, Christian, you need to understand that headship and hierarchy of authority is of God. It is in place in divinity. Look at that scripture again. Go back to the verse 3. It said, The head of Christ is God. Hmm. See that? Mm -hmm. So, headship is even in divinity. You know, when Jesus was on earth, he said, I am Father, we are one, whosoever has seen me has seen God. And people have asked questions Is Jesus equal to God? Or is, is you know, there is no question of that. Look at it. He said, the head of Christ, which is Jesus Christ, is God. See now? And Jesus never disputed it. Even I am Father as one, who said, I see me as the Father. Jesus, the, so in divinity, there's even hierarchy. In fact, when everything is finally said and done, what the Bible said is that Jesus we submit the authority, everything back to the Father. Mm. Everything, including Himself, back. God exalted Christ, gave Him a name above every other name now. God exalted Christ, gave Him a name above Him, that the name of Jesus, every name we bow, every tongue confess to the glory of God, the Father who did that. When every rebellion is taken care of, when a new heaven and a new earth is created, Christ, the Bible says, and Christ Himself will lay the authority down before the Father. So, so the, the, the hierarchy and authority is when you see people who don't like hierarchy and authority, they are satanic. They are being pushed by devil. They are anarchists. Anarchy is not of God. Rebellion is of Satan. Whether at home or you know in whatever form. So, therefore, the concept of headship must be in place in humanity because it is in. It, it, we can see it in divinity. So it must be in place in humanity. And it's demonstrated in particular in two places from the scripture we read now. From verse 1, be ye follow out of me. Who was me there? Their, their, their apostle. Mm. So he was their leader. As I am a follower of Christ. The, so so in, in the first place where hierarchy and authority is well instituted and established is the church. The place of leadership is well recognized in heaven. Rebellion against it is rebellion against God. And it comes with consequences. The second place is in marriage. You see, one of the areas where God is less concerned is the world. And that's why rebellion in the world, the world is, they take care of their own. You, you break the law, the, the government arrests and all of that. In the church, it's God who takes care of it. The same thing in marriage. You see it there. It said like angels are watching that thing. So which means in marriage, God is interested in authority and hierarchy. 
God is not interested in in um, in how much you make. So after all, they will make the money. Of course, if everybody should should bring what something to the table. But before we bring anything to the table at all, at all, there is a place of authority, and it is described there very clearly. Christ, is that God, Christ, man, and then woman, not male and female, man and woman in in marriage. Let's get it better from verse four now. And that is the one led to the concept of covering of air, and I will show you why that is there. So in verse 4, every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. For that is one and the same, as if her head was shaven, which means if it doesn't cover her head, let her shave her hair. For if a woman is not covered, let her also be shown. But if it is shameful for a woman to be shown or to be shaven, let her be covered. So now, and this now brings us to the concept of culture now. Now, the, the, the first thing I want you to understand from the air is that the Jewish culture and tradition, which actually formed the, the foundation culture, for the church many of the things we do for example the communion we do today was taken literally from the jewish feast of of passover now i want us to understand that the jewish were a people who had no culture of their own who for 430 years of their existence when jacob moved to egypt and that was when Judah and all of the, all the children moved to Egypt, you know. When, now, for 430 years, they had no culture of their own, as it were. Then, one day they left Egypt. For 40 years, they, they, they had um, transit flights in the wilderness. Then they moved to Canaan. When they got to Canaan, before they got to Canaan, God gave Moses, their leader, the law. A Ten Commandments, about 430 laws. And a lot of ordinances or way of doing their spiritual, their worship. Now, all of those put together was what eventually constituted the Jewish culture. All of those things was what constituted their culture. In fact, when you read it, you will see God did it to the point of even where how to where to put their toilet and all of that, how to clean out and all of that. All of that. Somebody is sick. How to do this? You know. So it was. So the Jewish culture and tradition mostly was drawn from Mosaic law, and they were aimed at two things. Number one, they was they were aimed to teach them godliness as against idolatry, and also to serve as a shadow of spiritual pattern. Now I want you to understand that Jewish culture to teach two things is to teach godliness as against idolatry. Also to serve as a pattern or a shadow. A shadow. So for example, when they built the tabernacle, the Bible said it was actually a replica, a shadow of the real tabernacle that was in heaven. So when they go and offer the same offering in the temple and all of that, they slaughter gold and sprinkle blood, it was a shadow of what Jesus was going to do in the realm of the Spirit for us when he offered himself for sacrifice. So the Jewish culture uh, then was to help them towards godliness, the Ten Commandments and the laws, and also to, you know, act good conduct and all of that against idolatry, or everything that has to do with godliness, then, and a shadow. And one of such was the headship of a marriage. Now, the, the women are divided into three. A virgin, a wife, that's what they call women, and a widow. When, so, a widow, and some cultural practices too, when, they are, when, somebody, when, they, when somebody is a widow, so they shave them. So, the removal of the hair shows that there is no head over that person again. So in their mar in marriage, how they distinct, how they know married women in the public is they color their head. It shows there's a covering over them because the men are seen as covering for the women. And that's why I said it that 
A, a woman, a woman should cover her hair in the public, and they are talking about public prayer here. So he has to cover her hair. And um, a, a man can't do that because it's, it's not the woman, it's not a woman. He's not going to marry somebody as a wife. A, a, a man is not going to become a wife. A man will be husband, a woman will be wife. And if the woman doesn't want to cover her head, then she has to shave it. To either show that she's widowed or she doesn't have a covering. Over herself. So that was the so that was the tradition. And that's why what the scripture was trying to lay out there for them that covering was to show being under marital covering. So covering of air. And it wasn't scarf or beret or turban. No. It's real covering. So when you have seen the Eastern women, you will understand it. So the Eastern women, the way they cover, that's it. The color, the color shows there's a covering over. There's a marital covering. While the widows will be shaven. Or, and that's why, for example, when a virgin is defiled and she's not married. She has to put ash on her head to show that she's not covered, but she's been uncovered. You understand now? So when Tara, the, the daughter of David, was defied by her brother, Hamnon, and he paid death penalty for it, he was killed for doing that. The lady had to push her, put ash on her head. In fact, she didn't need to tell anybody. As soon as they saw her with ash on her head, they know she was defiled. She didn't need to tell anybody. In fact, as soon as she got home, Absalom said, yeah, I know what happened. You understand now? So, so that was the tradition and the culture there that the cut, the, the, so the concept of head covering. So the head covering is to reflect there's a marital covering for the woman, they didn't expect men to marry as wife, to marry um, another person and be the wife. No, they expect the men to be husband and the, the and the woman to be wife. And uh, so it was that was it then. And it was a culture that I need to understand also that in those days they were not just Jews who were Jews by birth. They were what they call proselytes. Proselytes are non-Jews people, but who have taken on the Jews culture for whatever reason, by the way of marriage or breakups. And it was actually part of the prophecy God gave them in Deuteronomy that a time will come where he said, This is your wisdom among all nations which you find yourself. We will say, Who are these people Who's, who have such a law and ordinance that is so perfect? Who has God near in everything where they call calling upon? So and in Isaiah chapter 2, verses um verses 2 to 6, and Micah chapter 2 verse 6, he said, It shall come to pass that the mountain of house of the Lord, the mountain of house of Judah, that's Jude, will be exalted. He said, Every nation will run in, and out of them will proceed law and commandment, which means people will pick up their culture. So you have a lot of proselytes. That's why on the day of Pentecost, people that were there were not just Jews. The Bible said they came from everywhere. I said, We are hearing our language, which so they, they all came to. And Pentecost was supposed to be a Jewish feast. Uh, a feast that is done 50 days after the feast of um, of Passover. Then after that, you know, it's called the feast of the week, you know, before the last feast of the year, the feast of Ingadrin. So, so that was how it was then. So this was, so the concept of head covering was to reflect a woman, to distinguish a woman from a, a man. And that was why, when it's being addressed, it was addressed in the context of a man and a woman. Just the same way when people, you know, I think we did that in one of those teachings. I'm not sure whether we get there. We're talking about talking in the church or women exercising authority over men. It was talking about women using the opportunity of the church to exercise authority over their husband. Is that why I said when they get home, they should ask their husband. So you couldn't be talking about a girl. It doesn't have an husband, or you know, so so so, so that that is that context. So let's look at verses seven to 
10, it will also make it clearer for us. So he said, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. You see now, somebody else's wife cannot be your own glory. You know, somebody else cannot be the glory of another person's husband or wife. When he said the husband is the glory of wife, but the woman is the glory of man, talking about the wife and the husband now. See, he said, whosoever find a wife has found a good thing, he has obtained favor or glory from the Lord. So this is so this is talking about how the what you know glorifies men worse for them to have their own wife. So he said, for man is not from woman, but woman from man. Now, so when you look at what he's talking about here, the woman that was from a man was Eve from Adam. Another woman can be from another man. Eve was not from Cain or, or Tamar from Judah. No. Um, it's the wife that was cut from a woman. From, from, it's the wife that was cut from her husband. So, so that shows you that it's talking in the context of uh, a wife and a husband here. He says, so for man is not from a woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. So you can see it here. Now. So he's talking about marriage. It's talking about the concept of, of marriage. So let's look at those verses um, in the context of symbolism. So the covering of head is symbolic, is symbolism. Just the same way from those verse 7 to 10, we can see it, symbolism. Divine pattern at creation was God, man, Woman, let's look at it. It was God that was in existence first, and He said, Let us make man in our image and after our own likeness. And when He said that, He made just one man. So, when He made one man, they said, It's not good that this one man be alone. Then, from that man, He made another woe, another man, which was a woman. In fact, it was the man who called. The, the other creation woman so so the pattern is so and that was the exact pattern the apostle was painting there it's not derogatory it just shows how things came to be god man woman mm. you see and the pattern allows for harmony in structure god didn't create many men and many women, and some of them marry, and some of them they don't marry, no. So which means this is in the context of marriage. When God created one man and one woman, they married. Period. So it was a pattern of marriage. So the from and for concept are valid in marriage. We need to appreciate that concept. He said the woman was made from a man. If something is made from you, it's like you. It's not inferior to you. It's not superior to you. So it's like you. If something is made for you, two things. That which is made for you ought to fulfill its, the purpose for which it is made for you. One. Second side is you that it was made for ought to see it and cherish it as something that is made for you. Mm. So, 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 and that, and once we understand that in marriage, we will understand how it had to function. Mm. The woman was made for the man, and the man, the, and from the man also. It was from the man. Same substance, same kind. You know, God didn't, the Bible didn't even reflect that God breathed breath of life into Eve. It was the dust God breathed the breath of life into became Adam. By the time Eve was made, it was made from an active being. So the Bible never talk of how God breathed the breath of life into her again. No, there was no need. The breath of life was there. So which means same kind. Same quality. 
nothing inferior, nothing under. So the, the leadership of marriage is not based on inferiority and superiority. It's based on equality. Same kind. From. Then, for. It's made for you. If it's made for you, you look after it. So which means you're going to give account of it. And if you are made for him, you need to, um, to understand that also. And fulfill purpose. And that is why when purpose is not discovered, marriage is always a struggle. Praise God. Alright. So, and look at what the scripture says. I want us to read something from that scripture. Back to that scripture. It says in verse... So let's read it further. I say, For man is not from woman, but from man. Nor was man created for man, but woman for man. For this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol. You see now? So it's symbolism. The covering of earth, like I told you, a symbol of authority on our head. Now, a woman who is not married doesn't need symbol of authority because she doesn't have anyone on her head. So here he's talking about, so which means, so the, 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 the covering of head they were doing then was a symbol. It seemed, like I told you, culture, I, 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 I were either to enhance godliness, godliness in terms of godliness towards God and towards behaving towards the other because the, the, the commandment and the law were both vertical and horizontal and the ordinances was, were also like that. Now, so symbol. So, so it's either, so the, 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 the Mosaic law, as it were, or the whole of Old Testament was both to enhance godliness and to serve a symbol. Of the real thing. Now remember that the scripture in First Corinthians chapter Romans chapter seven said the law is spiritual, but the people that the law was given to they were kinda so they didn't even know it. They didn't. They, now, they, do you know they didn't know this thing was symbolic? They could cut somebody head because of this thing. You know, they stone the person. And once we understand that, it, so he said, for this reason, woman ought to have a symbol. A symbol of authority on our head because of the angels did you see that now mm -hmm. because of the angels so which means that submission to the husband or that symbol of authority mm -hmm. is also a depiction of the submission of the church to Christ mm -hmm. and of Christ to God and that is to teach angels or to show them that rebellion is not acceptable in the kingdom of God. Because what made Satan, Satan was rebellion. He said in his heart, I'm going to lift my throne above the stars of God. I'm going to be like the most high. Rebellion, I can't be under again. I can't do it. I'm, I can't. No, 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 no. No, I'm tired serving somebody. You wanted to be. And so, he said, treason, treason. And the war broke out in heaven. And Michael fought. And Satan fought. Even in the old dragon. Chapter 12 of the book of Revelation. And his fan place was found no more. He was cast out of heaven forever and ever. So, and he took a third of the star. So all what constitute what we call demons, principalities of darkness, rule of darkness, this world, and spiritual things, heavenly places today, today, were formerly, all of them were formerly angels. Just like Lucifer was an angel. Lucifer is not a bad name. Lucifer is son of the money. So, he now became diabolous Satan. Now, having said that, so he said the remaining angels, that symbol, and why angels? The place of prayer in particular is the place of visitation of angels. So he said, so when they do that, they are showing symbols to uh, the angelic body, you know, especially the one sent to to them. So he said. Uh, so now let's read verses 11 um, to, let me see, 11 to 12 now. 11 to 12. It said, nevertheless, I want us to look at how scripture balances itself out. You need to understand how scripture balances itself out. Nevertheless, neither man is independent of woman. You see that now? Nor 
woman independent of man which means in marriage we can't run parallel government in the lord christian marriage for as a woman came from man in in creation even so man also comes through woman in birth there's no man who gave birth to himself every man is given birth to by a woman see now so but all things were from god do you see that now mm. all things were from god so that shows us the balance side so that shows us that neither man or woman is superior but there's a place of hierarchy in marriage in marriage i need to keep saying it in marriage mm. and he's saying yeah that none is independent of the other and at the end of the day there's a the man came from woman in creation uh, the woman came from man in creation man men he, man came from woman in birth everybody came from god praise god so let's look at those three verses together under the god's bridge so what bridges the whole thing is god the concept of there's a God who bridges all things so that there's no fracture. Mm. So that somebody you see, so for example, any masculinity or feminism that is void of God will always lead to fracture and problem. Any masculinity you are doing that is void of God, or um, feminism that you are doing that is void of God, we create problem. You see, what takes oppression away from any ordinance for humanity is the submission to God by everybody involved. Why will a man who is the head not be oppressive and think is superior to his wife? Because he submitted to God. Mm -hmm. Why will a woman who is meant to be submissive not feel inferior and they all be rebellious because she submitted to God. So submission to God is the bridge that balances everything. That's why I said man is not independent of woman. Woman is not independent of man. But all are from God. Man, woman is from man. Man is also from woman. And all are from God. And that all now covers if somebody is not married. We are all from God. And that is why in the beginning of that scripture, verses 1 and 2, he said, Be imitator of me as an imitator of God, of Christ. For Christ, head, man is the head of man, man is the man. He said, Christ is the, God is the head of Christ. So which means, at the end of the day, whether you are a married lady or you are a single lady, a married man or a, 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 a single man, whether you are a widow or a widower, the whole concept is... God is the ultimate health and is the one through Christ whom we are approaching. So which means, if I'm going to navigate a, a traditional culture well, I'll be looking at how does this thing help me to serve God more? How does it help me to please God more? How does it draw me closer to God? Because that is the ultimate. Mm. Praise God. Hallelujah. So, we said, it, re see, it recognizes the... See, when you... Are submitted to God, as is described in the scripture, you will recognize the uniqueness of the other person, whether female or male. Any any culture and tradition that looks down on any person is not godly. Because everything is tied to God. When you look down on somebody, you are looking down on God, the Creator. When you are oppressing somebody, you are oppressing God. Jesus said, in those days, I will ask some people to leave heaven, just go to hell. He said, well, why, sir? He said, well, I was sick, you didn't visit me. I was hungry, you didn't give me food. I was thirsty, you didn't give me water. And Jesus, they said, ah, Jesus, no, 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 I trust us now. I love you, Jesus. I love Jesus. He said, stop singing. He said, stop singing that song now. He said, but Jesus, you know I love you. I play a lot of, of songs. He said, no, no, it's not about song. He said, but when did I see you? If I know Jesus, you know Jesus. Jesus, I love you. And Jesus said, no. He didn't do it to these people. To people. To these, these ones. And he was pointing at his disciples. People who believe in him. 
He said, and some people will be sitting at the back, they will say, come to the front. Your, your, no, your seat is really in front. Say, ah, what happened? Say, ah, when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me water. When I was in hospital, you visited me in prison, you visited me. Say, when did I do it, master? Me. Say, oh, you did it to, to, to these ones. Mm -hmm. So any, any culture or tradition, so the first thing you now look at is, how does it rate human being? How does it rate humanity? How does it treat humanity? How does that culture treat fellow person? If the if the culture is subjugative, suppressive, oppressive against any gender or against any person, it's not of God. It doesn't recognize that man come from woman, woman come from man, or come from God. It doesn't understand interdependency of gender. <coughs> it doesn't, and it's not of God. Praise God. So, so, and that is so that scripture is telling us that God bridge, when we build it, it recognizes uniqueness of the other party and importance of every gender in God. It also recognizes the interdependence of both gender. Now, the last part we're going to do. I want us to look at it under the concept of where church allows prevailing custom to pre so you see so when church gets somewhere at times the church allow prevailing custom so for example the covering of hair was a prevailing custom and the church allowed it there it was it was a prevailing custom it, it was what they could understand and it was a prevailing custom. And the, so let's read it, from verse thirteen to sixteen now. So that if you don't, we don't do it. And say, oh, oh, you will not go to hell. You are not covering your hair. It's not true. We don't, you're not going to go to hell. Look at it. He said, judge among yourself. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature. See now. It self teaches you. That if a man has long hair, it's a dishonor to him. So, so, so you see now. So, which means in this custom, that men don't have long hair. You can't go. To, you can't. You can't go among Caucasian and say they don't have long hair. They have long hair. And some of us don't have hair at all. He said, but if a woman has a long hair, it's a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. And look at verse 5, 16. I love that. But he said, if anybody seems to be contentious, that means if somebody has issue with it, we have no such custom, nor the church chase of God. So, so, so I want us to look at that under the concept of where the church allow prevailing custom. Now, so... The, the 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 treatment of air, whether it should be shaven or should be left, whether it should be long or should be short, was taken into consideration, especially because of the Jews, the Jews. It was taken a lot into the into consideration by the church. Like you can see, the apostle said there, he said it was taken into consideration. By nature there. He said then the church didn't try to upset what was their norm. Because it was their norm. He said, does nature not teach you? Men here don't grow long. It's women who have long hair. So it was their custom. It was their tradition. It was their custom there. And the church tried not to upset it. Because once the church tried upsetting it, what happens is... They will start focusing on minor and leave the major. Now, but it was a contentious issue. Not everybody agreed. And the reason why not everybody agrees is because not everybody was Jew. In fact, this church in Corinth was much of Gentile, but among them were proselytes. And if you see this tradition, this history of the church she's planted, their major problem were the Jews. In fact, when they took um um, Timothy, who was half Greek, half Jews, to the temples of the Jews, they have to shave his head. And Paul said, you know, you have to shave. Even though shaving his head didn't, he has nothing to do with God. 
But they wanted to enter the temple. And it's not full blood, you say he has to shave his head. And Paul said, go ahead. So which means, so this the covenant of air is contentious, was contentious then and is still contentious today. Somebody else wants to, somebody else doesn't want to. But if you want to, you know the reason why you're doing it. If you don't want to, you know the reason why you don't want to is symbol is symbolism of covering, you know, as it as it were in marriage. So and many who didn't have the Jewish or proselyte and proselyte background, they felt they didn't feel at home with it. And Paul said, you know what? There's nothing church can do about that. So he didn't say if anybody's contentious, we go to where. No, he said the church doesn't have that tradition. We can't, we can't upset the custom. The church doesn't have that tradition of upsetting the custom. Especially, it wasn't idolatrous custom. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't, um, it, it wasn't a bad culture. So he says, so we don't have the custom. We can't upset it. So if you are contentious about it, he said, deal with it. So, so conclusion today is, as a Christian, you're going to come into cultures and traditions, and what you need to watch out for is: does it enhance godliness? Does it symbolize godliness? Um, does it enhance evangelism, or does it hinder it? And above all, does it draw me to God? At the end of the day. The, the lesson they were able to draw from covering or not covering here is that all are under God. Yeah. We are all under God. Even though you might say I'm the head of the family, say yeah, you are under God. Wife under God. Children under God. All of us under Christ. And we follow leaders, spiritual leaders. We follow Christ. And then we make a good journey of Christianity. All right, that's the end of the teaching for tonight. It's a very, like I said, it's a controversial teaching. You know, covering of uh, you know how much fight people fought with this thing in those days. Oh my good Jesus! In fact, fellowships are always divided along this line. Women who wear trousers who cover air, those who don't wear trousers and don't cover air. You know, but the truth of the matter is, it is mere symbolism. I want you to go before the Lord and receive grace to please Him, to serve Him. Things that will make you imitate Christ more. You receive, say, Lord, I receive grace to be a, an imitator of Christ, a follower of Christ, to be a real, a real imitator of Christ in words, in deed, in things that I do in the name of Jesus. Oh, yes, Lord, I receive grace. I receive grace. I'm an imitator of Christ, a follower. And I will imitate him to the end. I will follow him to the end. In the name of Jesus, I'm submitted to God. Declare that Christ is your head. And uh, God is Christ's head. And if you are married, declare your husband. If you are a woman, your husband is your head. Just as Christ is your head and God is your head too. In the name of Jesus. And I want you to pray against spirit of rebellion and spirit of oppression also. Because it's not just rebellion spirit that works in marriage. It's spirit of oppression too. Suppression spirit, subjugation spirit, spirit of control, witchcrafty. Come against it by the blood of Jesus Christ. We come against it in homes and marriages. And every home where there's issue of submission and trouble and man is being oppressive, we pray for peace of God. We pray the heart of that kind of man will be touched. And in homes where the woman is rebellious, we pray that her heart will be touched. Rebellion we lift in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Go ahead and praise him. Hallelujah. In Jesus' marvelous name, we pray. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word and for the light that comes through it. We pray, Lord Almighty, that by it we will walk in truth Amen. and in reality Amen. of godliness. Amen. In the name of Jesus, Amen. we pray for miracles for as many as trust you for one or the other today. Healings in people's body, Lord. Amen. We pray for financial miracle. Miracle in their job. Amen. Every road the enemy is trying to block, we rebuild that enemy. Mm -hmm. By the blood of Jesus, we command open doors. Mm -hmm. We command roadblock to be removed. Mm -hmm. We command help given to God's mm -hmm. people. In the name of Jesus, mm -hmm. it is done. Mm -hmm. And blessed be God. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' marvelous name, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Alright, um, that's the end of it. Sunday service is going to be powerful. Let me see. I think I have what I'm going to be sharing with you. 
from not I don't not, let me see it's gonna be interesting anyway Amen. yeah okay oh lovely yes yeah, so we're going to be seeing the concept of open doors Amen. and you know the doors of nations will be being opened to you Amen. God wants to open the doors of nation to his children Amen. and believers must have open doors of nations mindset Amen. God recognizes nations nations are not nations include countries nations include tribes nations include professions nations include every gathering con every congruous gathering every homogeneous gathering is is referred to as nation either homogeneous in language homogeneous in culture homogeneous in practice in profession or what we now call country homogeneous in landmark yeah god wants to open and because in in them are treasures and blessings that are unique and god wants to open the doors of nations to you he doesn't want your life to be limited he doesn't want your life to be walled in so this Sunday is going to be powerful. I want you to join us, 312-214 London Road, RM79NH. If you can't make it to church because the numbers are limited, I want you to join online. If you book for the service, make sure you come. If you don't want to come, make sure you call in and give up the space so that we can give it to others. If you're coming or you're bringing somebody and you don't have space, Contact Pastor Titi and let's see if she they can if there are people who call it off or would who, who, who release their own space they can work out something for you. Until then, I want you to be strong in the Lord Amen. and in the power of His might. Amen. I want you to go in the might of the Lord, unintimidated. You see, there's no way we play the game that you will lose out Amen. because if God be for you, nothing can be against you successfully Amen. i want you to hold on i want you to keep pushing i want you to keep going forward it's a year of making appreciable progress Amen. and it's your season of open doors Amen. the lord bless you Amen. the lord keeps you Amen. the lord makes his face to shine Amen. upon you the lord be gracious to you Amen. but the lord lift up his countenance on Amen. you may god give you peace Amen. in jesus marvelous name Amen. 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 good night everyone see you later hallelujah Beginning to the end There's no place for